Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us to our Earth Day Everyday webinar series. My name is Steve Yarjo. I'm Associate Professor and County Agent for Ocean and Atlantic Counties. Um, we are very happy to have you all here joining us this evening um, with only a few weeks left in our Earth Day Everyday webinar series. Um, the seminar series was started last year um, in response to COVID, but also in response to the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, originally as Earth Day at Home. And the main idea for this program is to really give you guys tools that you can use to be more sustainable, more environmentally friendly at home, um, and to turn Earth Day into every day. Um, as we were saying at the top of the, this uh, presentation, that we have 10 more days till Earth Day, so hopefully you'll learn a couple of tips or tricks or methods that you can use every single day to make Earth Day every day and have it for the, um, 365 days out of the year. Um, this is being brought to you by Rutgers Quart Extension and the Natural Resources Work Group. Um, Rutgers Quart Extension is really kind of the outreach arm for Rutgers University, where we work with the public, municipalities, um, other governmental agencies, not for profits, to really take what's learned and studied and researched at the university out to um, the quote unquote real world. So we apply what's learned at the university to help protect the environment and to uh, restore and or protect our natural resources. Um, one thing I do wanna let you guys know about is that this webinar series um, is offered to you guys for free, um, but we do take donations through our environmental stewards program to help fund um, educational projects um, and internships through our environmental stewards program. And I will put information regarding that donation process into the chat for everybody to see. Speaking of the chat, the chat is how you're going to ask your questions this evening or answer some questions apparently, because I think our speaker will be asking you some questions tonight. So if you don't know how to use the chat, you should see a little um, chat button at the bottom. It looks like a cartoon word cloud where they would normally put the text in that a cartoon character was speaking in. Just click on that and the chat should appear on the right. Please make sure to send all of your chats and your questions to myself, Steve Yersha. Um, so that I can get them to our speaker tonight, uh, Michelle Backus. Um, tonight's speaker, Michelle, is the um, county agent and associate professor with the Union in Middlesex Counties for Rutgers Court Extension. And she'll be talking about rain barrels, rain gardens, and all things stormwater. Um, she is really good at her job, so good that she actually planned out rain for today to fit in <laughs> with our stormwater talk this evening. So good job, Michelle, on that. Uh, but one of the things I want you guys to be aware of is, Michelle, if you want to advance the slide, I'll, I'll talk about the, the project and the consent. Um, we are doing these educational uh, webinars, but we also want to get feedback from you guys as to how well they're doing. But we also want to know how um, the tips and the methods that we give you to, to use every day um, are working for you and if you're actually planning on doing anything. So as part of this, we have you guys participate in um, a poll that we'll have at the end of the talk with about 10, five to 10 minutes left in the talk. Um, but we do need you guys to give your consent. And that's actually the first question that's asked as part of the poll is, do you give your consent on this? So please, if you say yes, please fill out the poll at the end. It will pop up on your screen. Make sure to answer all the questions, but also make sure to click the submit button at the end of the poll to ensure that it gets submitted to us and we actually record your responses. Um, speaking of recording, we are recording this session this evening and we'll be sending out information regarding this recording um, in the future so you can get, you know, go to the website and re revisit this and, and relearn anything you may have missed or like myself talking too fast and kind of glossing over so you can kind of get rewatch it and, and relearn what's going on. So that's kind of my spiel and the introduction. Once again, we have our speaker this evening is Michelle Backus, um, who's a county agent and associate professor with Union and Middlesex counties, um, primarily working in natural resources and water um, conservation. And she is here tonight to talk to us about rain gardens, rain barrels, and how to protect a watershed at home. We wanna thank Michelle for, for doing this evening. Once again, please get your questions to me through the chat and take it away, Michelle, and thank you for doing this tonight. Thank you, thanks, Steve. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Earth Day Every Day. Uh, so tonight's uh, presentation is gonna, going to be all about what you folks can do at home to protect watersheds. Uh, it's very important to understand that um, the impact that our landscapes have on our watersheds, on local rivers, streams, lakes, and, and ponds. Um, so, so this 
this particular presentation is going to talk about some of the things that you've heard about in the plan in, in the past and some new things like green infrastructure um, and um, some, some lawn care, uh, some things that everyone can be doing uh, to protect water quality and reduce stormwater runoff. Some of you may be here this evening because you are part of the Eco-Friendly Yards uh, project for Manalapan, Monroe, Jamesburg, Spotswood, and Helmetta. Uh, folks are, are here tonight from across the, the, the state and that's, and that's great, but we do have a special project going on in what's called the Manalapan Brook Watershed. And these towns, if you're in these towns, Manalapan, Monroe, Jamesburg, Spotswood, and Helmetta, there are some special incentives that we have for, for you through a grant that we have through the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, I'm gonna talk about that more at the, at the end, um, native plants and soil test kits that you guys get for your yards help kick off your watershed friendly and eco friendly yards. So just stick with us till the, to the end. Attending this presentation qualifies you to receive those, those um, incentives. So we're going to start off by watching a video. And this is a video, there's a whole video series for, called Restoring the Mount Alpin Brook Watershed, which is a watershed in central New Jersey. And even though the video is specifically talking about the Manalapan watershed, the issues that are addressed in this video are statewide. And you know, it could be any watershed in the state that, that, they're, that they're talking about. They just, um, I'm happy to be talking about the Manalapan watershed in this, in this particular video. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this, this video. It's a nice introduction to some of the things we'll be talking about today. Oh, sorry. I'm Michelle Backus with Rutgers Cooperative Extension, and I'm going to talk to you about protecting our state's waterways. New Jersey's rivers, streams, lakes, and bays provide us with recreational opportunities like boating, fishing, and swimming, economic opportunities like commercial fishing and tourism, habitat for wildlife, and our precious drinking water supply. The land that surrounds and drains to these waterways is known as a watershed. When land within the watershed is healthy, then the waterway is healthy. But much of the land in New Jersey has been changed and many of our waterways are no longer healthy. The land has been developed, forests cut down, and soils compacted. In addition, roads, rooftops, parking lots, and other impervious surfaces prevent rainwater from soaking naturally into the ground. What can we do? We can get together with our peers and develop a plan, a plan for a healthy watershed. Let's take a closer look at how a group of organizations is helping to restore its watershed. I'm Enos Zimmerman, and I'm the district manager of the Freehold Soil Conservation District. The Manalapan Brook starts in Monmouth County in central New Jersey and continues to flow to the north into Middlesex County, to the South River, and into the Raritan River. The brook also flows through Manalapan Lake in Middlesex County's Thompson Park, enjoyed by thousands of community residents that visit the park each year. Like many of our New Jersey lakes and streams, the Manalapan has problems with pollution caused by excess stormwater runoff. Stormwater runoff is just the rainwater or melting snow that moves over the ground. In our developed communities, too much stormwater enters our waterways at one time through the storm drain system. These storm drains empty directly into our rivers and streams like the Manalapan Brook. The increase in stormwater runoff has caused severe erosion as well as excess sediment and nutrients to build up in Manalapan Brook and Lake. With funding from the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, several different projects are underway to address these problems. All of these projects not only improve water quality, but also use native plants to restore habitat and attract beneficial wildlife like birds and butterflies. One solution is to naturalize existing detention basins. These grass-covered basins are flood control structures designed to capture runoff from large rain events, then slowly release the water to Manalapan Brook. But these basins do a poor job controlling sediment buildup. By removing concrete channels, improving the soil, and planting flood-tolerant plants, these basins can do more to capture runoff and sediment. Also, basins will be mowed less frequently, saving money. 
Another solution is to stabilize sections of stream bank and shoreline with erosion control blankets and plants to hold the soil in place. Stream bank protection also helps reduce property loss for residents living along the stream. Also, floating wetland islands are being installed in Manalapan Lake. These islands remove small amounts of sediment and absorb excess nutrients from the water that would otherwise fuel nuisance algae blooms. We can all do our part to protect the Manalapan and other watersheds throughout New Jersey. Here are some suggestions. Never feed the geese. Pick up after your pet to prevent water pollution. Install a rain garden at your house to soak up excess rainwater runoff. Collect rainwater runoff from your roof with a rain barrel. Redirect downspouts from your roof so the rainwater soaks into your lawn or garden. Protect the storm drains. Never dump litter, animal waste, motor oil, or leaves into the storm drains. They all drain to the river. Okay, so um, Steve, you can hear me okay? Yes, you're good. Okay. Uh, so, so that video focused on the Manalapan watershed in central New Jersey, but I know you guys are joining us from all over New Jersey. So you can go ahead and if you know what watershed you are in, go ahead and in the, in the chat box, tell, tell Steve what, what watershed you are. What is your local river or, or, or stream that you live in? So maybe if you are in Northern New Jersey, you're joining us from the Palkins uh, Paul, Paulins Kill uh, watershed, or maybe you're in the Pequest River watershed, or maybe you're part of the Wall Kill. New Jersey, the Department of Environmental Protection, uh, divides up, loosely divides up the, the watersheds in New Jersey into 20 different watershed management areas. So that's why they're, they're numbered here on this map. Uh, so in green here, uh, all of these watersheds in green flow into the Delaware River. And uh, um, there's the Lakatong and Wikichioki Creek down, down here, which is two of my favorite watersheds in New Jersey. In purple, uh, up in northeastern New Jersey, there's the Passaic River watershed and the Hackensack River watershed. All of this orange here is the Raritan River watershed and also the Stony Brook No Stone watershed and the lower Raritan watershed. We also have in southern New Jersey, all of the streams in blue on the, on the western part of the state also flow into the Delaware River. So we have, um, there's Crosswicks Creek and Doctors Creek, which is the watershed that I'm in. There's also the Rancocas Creek and the Cohansee River. Uh, so maybe you're joining us for one, from one of those watersheds. And on the eastern part of the state, all of those uh, watersheds drain into the um, Atlantic Ocean. So we have Tom's River here, Great Egg Harbor. Um, so it's important to understand that no matter where you are when you are on land, no matter where you are in New Jersey, you are part of some, some watershed. And the watershed is just an area of land that drains to a common water body, like a river or a stream or um, a lake or the bay. Um, your watershed could, you know, could look like anything, it could be dominated by agriculture. Maybe you live in a more suburban watershed and, and there's lots of uh, strip malls. Maybe you live in a more ur uh, rural area and you have lots of forests, or maybe you're in a more urban area with um, tall buildings and, and parking lots and lots of, uh, lots of uh, streets. So you heard lots of different terms in that, um, in that video words like impervious cover and stormwater runoff. Let's clarify a couple of those terms. Stormwater runoff is, all it is, is rainwater. Another word for stormwater is rainwater. You don't have to have a major storm in order to have stormwater runoff. It's any, it's any snow melt, it's on, and any rain on the, on the ground that's, that's uh, flowing over a hard surface. And impervious cover is just all the hard surfaces that we see when we go out into the roof. It's our roofs. It's our driveways and parking lots. Um, it's big box stores. It's any hard surface on the ground. It's very, very important to understand that whenever the land in the watershed is changed, there's going to be an impact on water quality. In New Jersey, the land is historically forest and it's been developed in some uh, way. Most of, we have a lot of urbanization in New Jersey. 
And so this is an example of what we call a connected impervious surface. This particular series is about our, our home. So let's look at the impervious, impervious surfaces around our homes. On the left here, you know, typically there's a home, even if you live in an apartment building, there's a roof that collects water when it rains. It drains through a downspout and then it discharges that downspout, discharges maybe out to a driveway, maybe it goes underground and it discharges to the roadway. Then it gets to the storm drain system. And then it goes, that storm drain system, that underground network of pipes drains directly to a local waterway. Maybe it's held up briefly in some sort of detention basin like you see on the, on the right here. So the more impervious cover we have in the watershed, the more stormwater runoff we're going to have and also the more pollution we're going to have in a watershed. Maybe you live in a community like a more urban community like Camden or Newark or Trenton, Elizabeth. Uh, these are all, maybe Patterson, these are all communities that have what's called combined sewer systems. This is a picture of a combined sewer outfall in Perth Amboy, and you can see that it's discharging. There's water coming out of this pipe here. In those communities, the sanitary sewer system and the storm drain system are go through one pipe. And when you have a large rain event, there's raw sewage that's actually discharged into their rivers and streams. Most communities in New Jersey are not like that, but we, in our older, more industrial um, communities, we do still have these combined sewer systems. So part of having an increase in stormwater runoff and an increase in impervious cover means that we have more pollution, uh, specifically what's called non-point source pollution, meaning we can't point to exactly the source of where it's coming from. It's also called people pollution. It's the pollution that's generated as part of the, our daily activities. And today we wanna to talk to you about how you can reduce non-point source pollution. So it's oil and grease from cars. It's the fertilizer that's put on our, our lawns, excess fertilizer on our lawns, or excess fertilizer that's put on agricultural lands, farms, um, animal waste, people who don't pick up after their pets, or geese waste, Canada geese uh, waste, for example, uh, grass clippings that aren't cleaned up, system, septic seep, uh, system and sewage leaks, household cleaning products that are dumped uh, improperly, and then litter is also a type of non-point source pollution. So, uh, let's talk a little bit more about the pollutants that are found in runoff. So sediment is a major pollutant in New Jersey. This is one of our biggest pollutants, literally just soil particles transported from their source. So maybe it's coming, often people think that, you know, sediment is coming into a watershed or, or, or a river system because of construction sites. But the truth is that construction sites have pretty strict soil and erosion control standards that they have to abide by. A lot of times the sediment is actually being eroded from the stream itself or from an area that's, that's experiencing a lot of erosion and then deposited in the stream, causing problems for aquatic life, um, being stirred up in the water column. And then also if there's an impoundment or a pond, then that, uh, that lake or that pond has, uh, will fill up with sediments. Oxygen depleting material like excess leaves and organic material, especially in the fall, when leaves clog storm drains or are being dumped into a river, that material is broken down by bacteria that use up oxygen. And then this is what causes fish kills in a waterway. Um, it's called eutrophication when there's all this bacteria breaking down the organic uh, um, matter. Toxic materials like pesticides, heavy metals, petroleum hydrocarbons, um, coming from herbicides, fungicides, heavy metals like lead, zinc, and mercury, or hydrocarbons coming from automobile exhaust, uh, fuel and oil coming off of tires and getting into uh, our, our waterways. And then debris, literal, litter and illegal dumping. Right now, there's actually a lot of research being done on microplastics in the uh, waterways. We don't know a lot about, about microplastics and how it could potentially be affecting aquatic organisms and our drinking water supplies. And then there's nutrients, specifically nitrogen and phosphorus that are in fertilizer. So excess nitrogen and phosphorus that are put down um, on turf grass um, or used on farm fields. Maybe there's animal manure on farms that isn't being managed properly. This all gets into 
our waterways, our rivers and streams during rain events. And then there's also bacteria and pathogens from pets, uh, waterfowl, failing septic system. I have a big monitoring program on the lower Raritan River where we are specifically monitoring for pathogens so we can let people know when it's safe to recreate on the weekends, when it's safe to go swimming or when it's safe to um, be in, in the water. And then believe it or not, heated runoff. Uh, so hot runoff coming from asphalt, parking lots, and being discharged into a waterway is a type of pollution because, um, or when people remove stream side vegetation, cut down all the trees and the shrubs and the water heats up, that causes a problem for the aquatic community. Okay, so that was a very, very quick <laughs> and dirty uh, explanation for the issues that we have with stormwater runoff and, and water quality. Now I wanna talk to you about what you can be doing um, on your home landscapes to reduce stormwater runoff and protect water quality. So Steve, where were, were there some of the, the people have answers for what watersheds they were joining us from? Um, yeah, you, you really opened a can of worms on that one. It seems okay. like we have somebody represented from every watershed <laughs> in the state of New Jersey. I will point out, we do have someone from Ohio who's from the Grand River watershed. So they even knew their watershed, but we have people from Manalapin, Barnegat Bay, Passaic River, a bunch of people from Millstone in Delaware, tributaries, uh, right. a bunch of people from number 12, which I believe is the Monmouth County and Sandy Hook area, okay. people from Lower Raritan, so people from all over. Good, good. Well, it's nice to see everybody, and it's so good to know that people know what their local watershed. And if you don't know what your local watershed is, you can, EPA has a Find Your Watershed website where you can go on and look, even you can put in your zip code and they'll tell you what your, what your watershed is. So let's talk about how folks can be reducing stormwater runoff on their property and managing stormwater using what's called green infrastructure. I want you to think about how you can be saving the rain from the drain, like you see here, uh, this downspout that's going into the, into the ground. I want you to think about how you can be making your properties into a sponge to absorb rainwater runoff from your, from your uh, property. So this is the old way that communities manage stormwater. Historically, the way communities manage stormwater was the idea was to move stormwater as quickly away from developed areas as possible through the pipe network, uh, like we described earlier. Uh, that turned out to be a really bad idea. Hold on, my, my computer is not forwarding. Okay, um, and now, uh, the the um, the name of the game. What's um, people uh, developers by law now? Actually, the new stormwater rules, uh, which just went into effect in Mar in March, mandate that in New Jersey for new developments, new major developments, green infrastructure must be used on site to manage stormwater. What is green infrastructure? Green infrastructure is. Uh, infrastructure that uses soil and plants to soak up and treat polluted stormwater runoff rather than using pipes, um, using the pipe network and using uh, the roadway to, to move uh, stormwater away. Uh, the, the goal with green infrastructure is to manage stormwater at the source of where it is generated. So here in this picture, you see a parking lot with a uh, uh, asphalt uh, surface. When it rains, that's gonna generate a lot of runoff. And here was uh, a rain garden was installed. That's a curb cut that you see there. And when it rains, this water can just flow right into this rain garden and soak into the ground. It's also called a bioinfiltration basin. And they have a nice sign here telling people about the, this green infrastructure practice and what it's doing to protect water quality, reduce stormwater runoff volume, and also provide some habitat. So hopefully you will never look at another parking lot island the same way again. Um, that's the idea. That's what I want you to, to start thinking about. What can be done in our communities so that we change the way stormwater is, is managed? Here's another one. Uh, this, so that last uh, practice was uh, draining uh, stormwater from a parking lot. This one is a, a bioinfiltration basin or a rain garden basically that's accepting uh, runoff from the roadway. 
and the gutter. So here the rain enters over here through this curb cut and then it gets absorbed by this rain garden. This is actually in New York City where my mother lives in Flushing. They have a very large green infrastructure program in New York City. Philadelphia has one also. And there's in, in, in Flushing where I grew up, there's tons of these rain gardens on, on every street. So, so those are, are practices that are being put in our communities. But what you can you be doing at, at home to manage stormwater? So a great thing to do, and this week there's going to be a lot of rain, so I would encourage you to do this this week, is to go out and do an assessment of your downspouts. Um, it helps to go out in the rain, you know, get an umbrella, put on a raincoat, go outside and look to see how water is draining off of your property. So maybe you have a situation like this where the downspouts are draining onto a roadway, I'm sorry, onto a driveway. Um, and then that runoff is just going out into the street. Or maybe you have a situation like this where the da your downspouts on your home actually go underground and then discharge directly underground. There's, there's no opportunity here for the, the rainwater runoff to absorb into the ground or get, get treated at all. So what you can do is something called downspout disconnection or redirect your downspouts. And you are literally um, cutting your downspout like you see in the picture here and putting on a downspout extender. Um, so you can use uh, a, a metal uh, extender like you see on the upper left here or you can see use one of these accordion extenders that go up to like six feet and you can redirect or uh, disconnect your downspout so that the water goes onto the lawn or into a garden uh, bed instead of being lost onto a driveway or maybe a walkway and, and out to the storm drain system. This is a really inexpensive thing that you can do and have a really big impact. It's not, doesn't work everywhere. Uh, if you have, you should extend, if you have a crawl space, you can get away with two feet. Um, but if you have a basement, you should try to extend about, about uh, five to six feet. And then I realize also that some people are on small lots. You don't want to be discharging uh, rainwater into your neighbor's basement. But if you can do that, see if it's a possibility. This is a great inexpensive, inexpensive way to have an immediate impact. Something else that folks can be doing is harvesting rainwater. So we need to think about how we can use stormwater as a resource in our community, rather than something that we have to move away as quickly as, as possible. So there's actually a lot of rainwater that's generated just off of our roof surfaces. And for the most part, it's pretty clean. It's not, it doesn't meet drinking water standards, but it certainly can be used for irrigation and all sorts of other uses. Um, this industry, is called rainwater harvesting. So let's look at how much water can actually be harvested off, off of some different roof surfaces, surfaces. So an 800 square foot roof, so that 40 by 20 uh, foot roof in a one inch rainfall event. And we were talking about this earlier, probably in the last couple of days, most places have gotten about an inch of rain. We're going to get more later in the week. But in a, a one inch rainfall event, and just know that 90% of the rainfall events in New Jersey are about, about a quarter of an inch or less, um, off of an 800 square foot roof, you'd get about 500 gallons of water. So the average rain barrel, if you're going to install a rain barrel, is 50 gallons. So sometimes people come to me and say, oh, I have a really small home. I don't think I can install a rain barrel. You certainly, you certainly can. Even off of a shed, this is 140 square foot uh, shed 10 by 14 in a one inch rainfall event, you can get about 90 gallons of water off of a, a roof this size. So um, a great thing to do is to harvest rainwater with a rain barrel or maybe even a cistern and an underground cistern or above ground cistern. So if you are not familiar with rain barrels, I bet there's a lot of people out there who are familiar with rain barrels and some folks in the Manalpin watershed who are doing the, the eco-friendly yards project, I know we're, are, are getting a, a rain barrel as part of that project. So that's really awesome. This is a, a, about a 50 gallon rain barrel and there's different parts. So a rain barrel has to be installed on a downspout. Sometimes people say to me, Michelle, can I just put a barrel out 
in the middle of my backyard and let it just catch rainwater? No, you, you can't. It has to be installed on a downspout. You need a good sur size surface area to catch that rainwater. Uh, so it's connected to a downspout and um, you have to have a screen over your barrel here. You can see here, this is just fiberglass window screen. Um, very important to have a, a screen on your, your rain barrel um, because you do not want to attract mosquitoes. Any, any standing water will attract mosquitoes. You have to make sure to have a screen over your, the top of your rain barrel and also to make sure to have the overflow hose in place so that mosquitoes can't get in there also. So um, that's how water gets into the barrel and then it rains, the barrel fills up. And then um, so that your barrel doesn't overflow from the top, uh, you have an overflow hose on the side, that you, the side that you can then redirect that overflow wherever you want. And this is just a regular garden hose, but there's all sorts of overflow hoses that you can use. Uh, the barrel is typically elevated onto a platform that's about an inch, I'm sorry, about a foot off of the ground. And it's a passive system. It's really not going to generate any sort of pressure. So you're really just using a watering can uh, to water plants with. Um, so you, the water comes out via, via the faucet here. So um, when you install a rain barrel, it's very easy. The, the materials are very inexpensive at local, local uh, hardware stores. You're just cutting your, you put your platform in place, you put your rain barrel in place, and then you cut the, the downspout with a saw and you can put an elbow on or some sort of flexible elbow, something like that to redirect the um, water into your downspout. But that, that rain barrel that you saw was kind of a do-it-yourself uh, rain barrel. Um, cost for rain barrels, if it's a DIY, DIY uh, project, then it can be anywhere from $25. If you can get a free barrel, uh, one of these blue you know, industrial barrels, then it, just the materials to retrofit it could be anywhere from $25 to $50. A new rain barrel will be more expensive. It could be anywhere from $100 to $300. And you can see some pictures here of what, what um, there's, if you do a search for rain barrels online, you will see a ton of information. People do all sorts of cool things. They, they set them up in tandem, you know, so you can capture more rainwater. And then I also just want to point out here, um, this rain barrel on the left where it says Forest Resource Education Center. This is a really nice system here. You can, you can purchase a downspout diverter, and that's another way to get water into the, the rain barrel rather than um, cutting it and diverting, diverting the, uh, putting an elbow on. And those are available online, those downspout diverters. Okay, so that was rainwater harvesting. Um, there's lots and lots of, I just, uh, you know, scratched the surface with what can be done with rainwater harvesting. Uh, but now we're going to move on to rain gardens. Uh, hopefully, Folks already know what, what rain guards are, but if you not, if you don't, that's okay. Uh, rain gardens are, this is the language that I use to describe rain, rain gardens. Rain gardens originally are actually an, an engineered system. They're actually called uh, bioinfiltration basins, but I can't convince anybody to put a bioinfiltration basin in their front yard. So we use some marketing terms like rain garden uh, to convince people to, to put in these types of structures. So sometimes you'll see rain gardens described as shallow landscape depressions. Um, and I try not to use that kind of language because who wants a shallow landscape depression in their front yard? But rain gardens are beautiful, low maintenance and inexpensive gardens that you can install at home. When it rains, runoff is directed into the garden instead of the street. And rain gardens help reduce flooding and pollution in local watersheds. So if you're trying to convince your community to, to install more rain gardens, uh, that's, that's uh, some language that you can use. So see, like you see in this picture here, uh, roof runoff is directed from a downspout into the, the rain garden. And typically we use native plants in a rain garden because rain gardens are actually dry most of the time. The only time when they're wet is when it actually rains. So this is a cross section of a rain garden. And rain gardens are meant to capture rainwater runoff, filter it out. Filter. So if uh, I'll show you some, I, I showed you earlier some, some pictures of 
rain gardens that are on sidewalks and are in parking lots. You can imagine there's a lot of pollutants coming off of those surfaces. So rain gardens are really, really effective at uh, cleaning up the, those uh, pollutants and absorbing, absorbing and assimilating them. And then soaking up and infiltrating into the ground rainwater uh, runoff. So typically rain gardens um, are these, they, they're very, very shallow. They're almost like a little bowl or basin sitting in the landscape. Typical gardens are built up kind of on a mound, but basins are, uh, rain gardens are actually dug out like you see here. They're not very deep though. You're not building an in-ground pool or a pond. You're simply, simply building a very small, very shallow basin that you can uh, redirect storm water in, into. And typically you're amending the soils with uh, sand so that you get greater infiltration. There's th really three parts to a rain garden. There's the berm, which is the upland area here. That's where you would put plants that, that uh, uh, can tolerate dry conditions. And then there's the slope, which is the area here that connects the berm to the ponding area. And the ponding area is the largest part of the rain garden where plants are put that, that can tolerate being inundated with water. Native plants typically that are found along river systems or in wetland communities. And then you redirect water into the rain garden using uh, a pipe, a swale or, or a downspout. So here is a, a picture of a rain garden in front of a residential home. Sometimes people tell us that they don't really want a rain garden on their property because it looks too wild um, or too natural and they're not used to that aesthetic. But rain gardens can, can add curb appeal and can look like a conventional garden that you would see in the landscape, in a home landscape. So this is a rain garden when it was first put in. And this rain garden is accepting runoff from the roof of this home here. You can see the downspout and the water from the downspout is gonna go into this rain garden. You can't really tell, but it's a very, very shallow uh, basin here. This is the berm where the rocks are around the, around the edge, but it's also accepting runoff from this driveway here. So there's two places where runoff will enter this rain garden. And so this is kind of the, the baby stage when the plants were first installed, but this is it about two years later. So you can see this rain garden did very well. Um, on the left here are some blue flag iris, and then you have a nice viburnum here. And then I think on the right is blue, blue mist flower, I, I, I think. And then they've done some nice edging, some nice stonework around the edge and put in uh, some solar light and the, the, the stonework was nice to match the, uh, the bread brick of the house. So this is a great example of a residential rain garden, how it can be put in to really you know, provide a curb appeal and, and add to an aesthetic of a home. This is another one. And you can see that the rainwater runoff is entering the, the rain garden here from this downspout. It used to go out to the street. It was cut. And now while that water is being absorbed into the ground, and then they put some nice annuals on the berm here to add some color. This plant here in the middle of the rain garden is called um, uh, soft rush. We use that a lot in rain gardens. That's a great plant, a great native plant to put at, the, at, a, at a downspout or in the rain garden. It likes, it likes to have its feet wet. Cost for rain gardens, if it's just you and some friends on the weekend, it could be as much as five, as little as $5 per square foot or it could be as much as $25 per square foot if you're hiring a professional landscaper. And if you are looking for a landscaper to do this, Rutgers has uh, the Rutgers Organic Land Care Program and they have a Find the la a Landscaper link. And um, that may be one place to look for a landscaper to do this for you. Also, um, I'm a big fan of signs in rain gardens telling the public you know, that this is a rain garden, here's all the great things that it's doing for, for our watershed. So some, so um, quickly, I'm gonna give you a quick and dirty <laughs> uh, uh, tutorial on how to install a rain garden. This is typically a, a three hour or even a full day uh, class, uh, rain garden, how to build a rain garden, um, but I'm gonna give it to you in about two minutes. So some things to think about is rain gardens can't be put everywhere. 
If you want to put a rain garden on your property, you need to walk around your property. They really, they can't be put under a drip line of a, of a tree. It also can't be put uh, within 10, foot of, 10 feet of a basement. You don't want to be infiltrating water into your basement. You also have to figure out what surface you're going to drain to the rain garden. Are you going to drain your roof? Are you going to drain your driveway? And then you're going to have to determine the size of that, what's called the drainage area. Um, once you know the size of the drainage area and you know your soil type, and the way you know, figure out your soil type is uh, you do a soil test and you can send that to the Rutgers uh, Soil Laboratory. I'll talk about that in, in a little while. You have to figure out whether or not you have sandy soil, clay soil, or maybe a silt loam soil. You also do an infiltration test, which is just digging a hole in the ground and, and uh, pouring water in it, and you're measuring to see how fast it infiltrates. So once you know what types of soil you have, and once you know your, how the, the size of your drainage area, then you can figure out how big your, your rain garden will be. And on a, resident, on a residential property, typical rain garden is about 100, 150 square, square feet. So then once you have all that information, you can go out and you can lay out your rain garden and dig it out with some friends, add soil amendments. Typically you're adding sand uh, to the soil, maybe some compost to help with that infiltration. You have to create an overflow, a specific place where the rain garden will, will overflow to. And then you're going to put in place your plants, your native plants, and you'll place them in the rain garden based on their wetness tolerance. Um, you'll put plants that like to be dry in, on, the, on the berm and plants that like to be wet in the ponding area. You add mulch, uh, about I think about three inches of mulch, of mulch, and then you have to water. In the first year, I, I know it seems kind of counterintuitive to water a rain garden, but see these uh, little plants, little plugs that this gentleman has, has just put in the ground here. Uh, they, it's very important to water any new plantings when they're put into the, into the ground, especially if we have a dry year. And then you have to just observe the rain garden um, when it's raining and make any modifications based on what you're, based on what you're seeing. And that's it, <laughs> easy, right? Uh, so we have lots of other really good resources on how to build a rain garden. There's the Rain Garden Manual of New Jersey, which is free and online. You can do a search for that. And then there's a rain garden app with videos from the University of Connecticut that you can download and it takes you through step-by-step -step how to build a rain garden. So some other green infrastructure practices, um, I wanna make sure to mention permeable surfaces and our coworker, Amy Rowe is an expert on this. She wrote the fact sheet that you can look up on um, porous pavements in, in New Jersey. I have a list of resources at the end. On the left here is uh, porous concrete. So these are all surfaces that look like conventional surface when you look at them, but are actually a porous material uh, that allows water to infiltrate through them rather than over them. Uh, so these are really, really awesome. <laughs> Um, we would love to see these used more in New Jersey. And hopefully with the new stormwater rules, they will be used more. So on the left is a, is a pervious concrete and B is a, is a porous asphalt, which is probably one of the better materials for our climate in, in New Jersey. There's also these interlocking concrete pavers, which are pretty cool and uh, um, water infiltrates through the surrounding uh, media there. So the surrounding gravel. And then there are these grid pavers uh, that have these big spaces for, for with, that grass can, can grow through, good for parking lots. So in terms of cost, these, these types of pavements are definitely more expensive than conventional pavements. Um, so the permeable stone pavers are the, the uh, more expensive materials, anywhere from 10 to $30. Costs really vary for this stuff. I got this online just yesterday, the home, homeguide.com, but costs can really vary for these types of materials. This is just to give you a sense of how much it costs per square feet. So another very important thing to, to do, another green infrastructure practice is if you live along a stream or along a lake, um, it is very, very important to make sure in order to protect our watersheds, reduce stormwater runoff, protect water quality, to keep the riparian buffer in place. The riparian buffer is just the vegetated area along the stream 
um, or around a lake or a pond. This is incredibly important. And a lot of townships and a lot of people, what they do is they just mow right down to the stream bank. And that is not good for the aquatic ecosystem. Um, there should be trees on the stream bank, there should be shrubs on the stream bank and grasses that help to shade the stream, that help support the aquatic food web and whose roots help to keep, um, help to stabilize the, the stream bank. So I wanna make sure to mention that also if any of you live along uh, a stream. Okay, that's, that's kind of done with the green infrastructure portion of it. Um, I'm gonna move on now to lawn care practices. What you can be doing to make your lawns into a sponge. Folks don't always realize that there's a lot they, they can be doing on their home landscapes when it comes to lawn care in terms of reducing stormwater runoff. But Steve, before I go on, was there any major green infrastructure questions that you want me to answer? Um, we do have a couple, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, one of the questions that somebody had was about um, winter care for your rain barrel. Like okay. what do you do with a rain barrel in the winter time? Well, um, I used to say that you can just, you can just keep, you should just drain the barrel and, uh, um, and uh, uh, keep it outside as long as it's drained and you keep the faucet open. But the truth is if you want that barrel to last a very a long time, you should probably drain the barrel um, and then uh, take it inside and then just keep that, uh, keep, keep that lower portion of the downspout so that you can reconnect it during the winter months. Okay, someone else asked about obtaining a rain barrel. Are there any programs in the counties or the state through which they can purchase a rain barrel? That really varies. It re I'm not aware of, there, there used to be more, this is the time if anybody's having a rain barrel workshop, a lot of times they're happening in the spring. So what you could just do is just go online and um, do a search for you know, rain barrel workshop or rain barrel program. Uh, sometimes counties, I know Union County, um, did have uh, a rain barrel, uh, did provide rain barrels to their citizens for a while. I don't think they're doing that right now. Um, so it, it really, it really varies. And I'm, I'm not aware of, of um, any in particular that are going around right now. That doesn't mean that they're not happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be a good idea to check with local environmental organizations, especially around this Earth Day time, as Michelle yeah. mentioned, to try and find yeah. something. Um, I will ask you one more question. I do have a couple of on um, porous pavement that I might punt to Amy. Okay. Um, Cause they're asking about design. Okay, yes, punt okay. to Amy. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the questions that somebody asked is if, if you have a riparian buffer, what's a recommended width for that riparian buffer? Buffer, How wide should it be? Oh my goodness. That is, that is the research question you this if, if, if you look at the literature on this you people have gotten entire PhDs and master's thesis is just asking that question what is the appropriate buffer width uh, to maximize uh, water quality um, it it really it really depends um, so it depends on specifically you know what it is that you're trying to protect, um, how much erosion there is. The, the general question, the general answer to that is as much as humanly possible. <laughs> um, so, so if you, you know, need a, a, a lawn, um, you know, I, I would just see, see how much of that lawn that, that you can spare. Even tall grasses, where you can have those uh, grasses form really deep root systems are, are great for, uh, for um, stabilizing the stream bank and providing a really good riparian buffer. So it, it, it really depends on where you are. Also, New Jersey does have rules about, um, about this. You know, there's, there's rules about how much of the riparian, especially that are dependent upon um, the type of waterway you're along. Sometimes it's a 300 foot buffer. Sometimes that's reduced depending upon um, uh, the, the surface water quality standards of that particular river or stream. Okay. Um, what I will do, is I will let you continue on. There are other questions, but we'll hit them at the end for you, Michelle, okay? Okay, great. Okay, so let's not talk about lawn care. And I also want to mention that we have a whole other Earth Day Everyday presentation, a, pre a recorded presentation that was done 
last year at this time by our coworker, Bill Lubick, called Earthwise Lawn Care. And if you, that's a full hour just on lawn care, environmentally friendly lawn care options. You can go to our Earth Day Everyday website and you can listen to that recording. There's a spring one and there's a fall one that are both excellent to review this time of year. So lawns, lawns are, you know, there's good things about lawns and there's bad things about, about lawns. Um, lawns are great for recreation. The turf grass is incredibly resilient. I have two boys, they both play soccer and they, they tear up our lawn by like, like crazy. And there's few other plants that can actually uh, handle that kind of, of damage. They all a, a good healthy lawn um, with a good with good root system can control soil erosion. And if you have good soil um, on your lawn, then it can help reduce stormwater runoff. Uh, the bad parts of, of lawn is that often um, on residential landscapes, they're very often compacted, meaning the soil is uh, smushed basically, and there's very little pore space. Um, so it can be compacted from heavy machinery running all over it, especially when it's, it's wet, uh, even from mowing the lawn over and over and over again. Steve Yerjo did a great presentation. It was our first one last year on soil and how to reduce compaction. Uh, outside, it uses, lawns use a lot of outside inputs. They use a lot of water, fertilizer, and pesticides. Uh, to maintain that lawn. It has very low habitat value unless you have a lawn that has clover and is if you're okay with clover and you're okay with dandelions in, in your lawn, a lot of times it's just a monoculture and there's very low biodiversity. Also takes a, it's pretty high maintenance. So, but let's talk about when you, if you want to make your lawn into a sponge, the first thing that you should do is have a soil test. No one should be applying any product to their lawn without first having a soil test showing that they actually need, for example, the fertilizer that you think that you need. And we have at Rutgers a soil testing laboratory and the good people at that uh, soil testing laboratory, Stephanie Murphy and her staff are, are waiting, are waiting for, your, for you to send them your soil samples. Uh, you can go online to their website, just do a search for Rutgers Soil Testing Laboratory and uh, you can download their soil sampling instructions and their questionnaire, their form that you send in with your soil sample that you put into a Ziploc bag. So they have all of those instructions as long as, along with their fees on their website. Some things to think about when you're doing soil testing. So this diagram on the left here just shows, you know, if you, you wanna go outside and think about where you're going to take your samples, you have a vegetable garden and maybe you have a tree and shrub garden, those should be separate samples. So for example, where it says front lawn, all those purple dots there, you would be taking a bunch of sub, what are called sub samples um, from your, for example, your front lawn and you wanna take them in a random fashion. Uh, so nine to 10, you know, uh, sub samples that you would take and it would look something like this. You could do it with the trowel and you dig it in your trowel into the, into the soil and you take a slice of the soil. But what you wanna do is you want to remove that top organic layer that has the turf with its roofs, remove that. And then what you put into the, the bucket, you're gonna have a bucket that you're gonna put all these subsamples into. Um, you, put, you just put the bottom portion like you see in yellow here into the bucket. And then you're gonna take a bunch of subsamples, put in a bucket, mix it up really, really well, like you're making a cake, like you're combining the flour and the sugar and the baking soda. And then you're just gonna take about a cup and a half of soil and that's what you're gonna send to the, to, to the lab. And then they're going to either email you or mail you back the soil test results. And they'll, they'll uh, give you a fertility analysis. They'll tell you the pH of your soil. And they will also tell you if you need fertilizer and how much to put down. Putting down fertilizer on a lawn without knowing if you need it is like going to, you know, just like self-medicating without knowing what's wrong with you. You may not know that New Jersey has a pretty strict fertilizer law that was adopted in 20, 2011. It limits when fertilizer can be applied to lawns. So fertilizer can only be applied to lawns between March 1st and November 15th in New Jersey. And it also bans um, applying phosphorus, uh, fertilizer containing phosphorus 
So the fertilizer, uh, the lawn fertilizer bags were all reformulated so that the middle number, there's three numbers on the bag, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, and uh, um, the middle one is uh, phosphorus and that should be zero. Uh, so so um, you, you shouldn't have to worry about you should not have to worry about whether or not you're putting phosphorus on your lawn because the bags has, have already been reformulated. So um, you, you want to uh, uh, get your soil tests done and then they will give you, uh, they will let you know how much fertilizer to put down. And they even have a database that can tell you based on how much fertilizer you need, the types of fertilizers that are out, out there you can choose to uh, use a conventional fertilizer or an organic fertilizer. The law also restricts the nitrogen amount of nitrogen used per application and the total for the year. So you should be following those soil test results. And then there are certain common sense practices that you should be following. Nobody should actually be fertilizing their lawn right now or in the last few days, because you, by law, you're not allowed to apply fertilizer during a rain event um, or right before a rain event, and you shouldn't be applying fertilizer to a hard surface. You have to you have to sweep up any fertilizer pellets that are on a the sidewalk or get onto the driveway. You're also not allowed to apply fertilizer within 25 wood feet of a waterway. There's some exceptions to these rules here, but this is generally what the fertilizer law says. So moving Michelle? on, yes. Um, I'm just going to start the poll now because oh. it's about five minutes left. So okay, for great. everyone who's participating, I'm going to start the poll. Please both listen to Michelle and fill out the poll. <laughs> and also, please make sure that you hit submit at the end of the poll so we get the information from you guys. Sorry about that, Michelle. Please continue. That's OK. Uh, there's just a couple of uh, slides, slides left. So I would also encourage you to build your soil with compost because compost really helps hold on to water. It also helps reduce evapor evaporation. So think about aerating your lawn. This also helps to reduce compaction. And you, if you listen to Steve Yerjo's uh, talk on soil compaction from last year, you, you know this. But just like you see in this diagram here, compacted soil, it's very difficult for roots to penetrate compacted soil. You aerate your, your soil in the fall is actually the best time to aerate your soil. You can rent an aerator from a, a local hardware store. And then you, uh, you can top dress with, with compost. Maybe about three quarters of an inch to an, or an inch of compost and then just rake that in. And then you'll have a new, better root system and nice thick, uh, thick turf. So that's a great way to help make your lawn into a sponge. Hold on. Having, okay. Another cultural practice, all of these are what's called uh, turf care cultural practices. It's very important to mow your turf, uh, mow high, mow at three inches. So raise your lawnmower blade to establish taller grass. Taller grass helps promote deep, a deep root system, helps shade the root system, and then holds moisture better than a closely cropped lawn. So you can see on the left here that this turf that's been allowed to get to three inches has established a deeper root system, whereas the one on the right that's been mowed low, has been cropped, has just this kind of weak, uh, a shallow root system. And that's not what we want. We want a deep uh, root system to help infiltrate water into the ground. In terms of watering practices, this is something else that's done really poorly <laughs> by most people on their, their lawns. Um, people should not be watering. There's no reason to water your lawn every day. Frequent watering also creates shallow roots. So what you want to do is most lawns in New Jersey need about an inch of water per week. That varies based on soil type, whether or not you have clay soil or sandy soil. So you only need about an inch of water per week. And that's, you know, so you want to keep track of how much it's, it's rain. Um, and you only put down um, how much you need. You want to take into consideration precipitation. Also, don't let lawn irrigation become a stormwater problem. Uh, so, so in this picture, what you're seeing here is I was on a walk. Someone had their, you know, uh, their their irrigation heads uh, pointed in the wrong direction, 
And also they were overwatering their, their lawn and it was all draining out to the roadway. It hadn't rained in about a week, but yet we were still seeing all this water going down the, the curb. This should never happen. This is as a result of someone whose, whose lawn is basically like concrete and the water is just sheet flowing off of the, of the lawn. So you really should not have irrigation water draining off of the turf like this. So you've, you've heard us talk about the importance of native plants, of using native plants in, in the landscape. Another really good thing to do on your lawn is to reduce the size of your lawn. I read somewhere that if the only time that you see a certain part of your lawn is when you mow it, you have to question whether or not that needs to be lawn. So consider replacing part of your lawn with native plants that are low maintenance. Native plants need no fertilizer and very little water in order to thrive. The native plants are plants that you find in, in nature, plants that you find in local forests and wetlands and are adapted to our local climates. They also are part of local food webs and help support local ecosystems. In general, native plants are plants that have been here before European colonization. So you could make part of your lawn into a butterfly garden or a pollinator garden. You could create a rain garden or a bioswale. The pictures that you see here are, I really, really love early spring ephemerals. These are native plants that come up in the early spring in a, in a forest before there's canopy cover, before the, the, the uh, leaves of the trees come out. So they're kind of taking advantage of all the light and they help support early spring pollinators. Uh, so, so these are some really, really, so it's, if you, you know, want something to replace your daffodils or replace your tulips that, or your crocuses that come up in the early spring, these plants here are, are great. And this is what's coming up in my yard right now. And it's really, really beautiful. Uh, these are some native plants from the, that, that I don't, I don't have a native plant slide for every season. That was one for the early spring. These are some summer blooms. So if you know this Asclepius um, species, that's uh, milkweed, or also this one is called butterfly weed, has beautiful orange flower, supports monarch butterflies. There's Joe pie weed. These all, these all bloom in the summer. Bee balm is great for hummingbirds. Foxglove beard's tongue, the bumblebees love it. And also blue lobelia is also one of my favorites. So in summary, Think about how you can reduce non-point source pollution and stormwater runoff from your property. And here is just a summary of some of the things that we've talked about. How can you protect the storm drains? Never dump litter, motor oil, animal waste, or leaves into the storm wind. Pick up after your pet and do not feed the geese because their geese just causes uh, water quality pollution. Get your soil tested. This is a great time of the year to have your soil tested. Apply fertilizer and pesticides based on manufacturer's instructions. Read the bag. Read the bag when you're applying fertilizer um, and apply it based on your soil test recommendation. Think about reducing lawn size and using native plants. And think about how you can make your lawn into a sponge. Use rain barrels, install rain gardens, redirect. Is there an opportunity to redirect downspouts? Reduce paved surfaces. And then also consider gravel mulch or porous pavement for walkways and, and driveways. These are a bunch of resources that supports different parts of this presentation, fact sheets and other um, websites that you can look to to help you create the eco-friendly, watershed-friendly yard. Okay, and I think that's I think that's it. Folks that well, I'm happy to take questions. And if the folks who are part of the eco-friendly yards project could just stick around for a little while. I will talk to you about the next step in terms of getting plants and your soil test kit and, and the other stuff that's going on with that project. Fantastic, Michelle. I do have a couple of questions if you have some time. Yes. One of the questions was, can you use um, harvested rainwater from your roof on an ed edible garden? Uh, yes, we, you can. And actually we have a whole fact sheet about this, which Steve was, was I believe, a part of, um, right? Didn't you help us with that, with that yes. data from that fact sheet? So a coworker and I, Mike Haberlin, did a study looking, asking exactly that question. We tested rain barrel water from suburban uh, neighborhood and also from an urban neighborhood. And what we found was that the water quality was actually pretty good. 
it was by no means uh, drinking water standards, but it was good enough that it could be used to irrigate a vegetable garden. What we recommend is that you apply the water to the soil, not to the plant itself. So you shouldn't be, you know, pouring the water onto your spinach, onto your lettuce or something like that. You should be uh, uh, irrigating the soil. And then also you may want to, because we did have a couple of times where the pathogen levels were a little bit high. So because for that reason, we recommend putting like a tablespoon of bleach into a 50 gallon uh, rain barrel uh, to kind of kill those pathogens. But otherwise it would, could definitely be used on a vegetable garden. Thank you, Michelle. Just a reminder that the poll is still open. If you could fill that out for us, that would be fantastic. Um, someone else is asking in, in general about the, um, when you started talking about the, the emergent plants that, that come into the, the, the beginning of a forest, they yes. were asking in general, like, is it a good idea to help make a property mimic a natural area like a forest to help reduce runoff, et cetera? Uh, well, Yes, that's that's sort of a, a general question. In, in general, there is an entire movement going on right now to increase habitat on our landscape. So typically the way we think of our landscapes in terms of the aesthetics and in terms of the curb appeal is the, historically we're, we're kind of basing it on this very old this kind of 1960s way of designing our home landscapes. But there is a lot of emphasis now on thinking differently about our home landscapes, thinking about how they can have ecosystem services. Um, in, in addition to absorbing rainwater runoff, what can we be doing to support pollinators? What can we be doing to, um, to increase biodiversity and support local wildlife? Um, how can we be incorporating more native, native plants, uh, trees and, and shrubs that, so that we can re recreate nature in our, in our own backyard? So, so I, you know, I'm not the only one talking about this. There's, there's lots and lots of other resources on, on, on this and lots of other people talking ab about um, what we can be doing to, to increase habitat in our, in our yards. Um. So I, I kind of saved the, the big picture question towards the end here. Um, someone was asking about um, all the, the practices that you mentioned, but isn't there um, a way to work with some uh, detention basins, et cetera, to do any sort of retrofitting of the older style water management structures? And how can they go about doing that with their town? Okay, that is a great question. Uh, if you are in a position where you can uh, work with your township, to retrofit existing structures, then um, that is a great thing to do. Uh, retrofitting to, to, so that they're, they are greener, to, to install green infrastructure. So for example, these kind of old school detention basins with the low flow concrete line channel, um, those we have uh, a whole video of how we did that in the Manalapan watershed. Um, if you, if you go to the website, uh, tinyurl.com forward slash Manalapan Watershed, um, then there's a whole video series on a whole bunch of community level, municipal level best management practices that can be, that can be used, in, including naturalizing uh, detention basins. There's lots of different ways to do it. It could be just as easy as letting the grass grow um, and allowing the grass to establish deeper root systems, uh, still keeping it neat so that there's a buffer or, around it, a, a mode buffer around it. That's the, the most inexpensive way of doing it. But then there's other ways of doing it where the soil is rototilled and you're putting in wetland uh, type plants that can help to absorb rainwater runoff, but that it's absolutely possible to retrofit existing structures. There's the Green Infrastructure Manual of New Jersey that you would want to take a look at. Uh, that would provide some great guidance for you for municipalities. The Rain Garden Manual of New Jersey would also be really good. All right, Michelle, that was the majority of the, the questions. We were able to, to get a, a few of them off. 
I did put in the chat the um, the link for the rain garden manual for New Jersey. So that is available for people as well as some of the New Jersey stormwater um, breast management practices for pervious pavements and permeable pavements. That was a big question that came up as well. Lots of great comments, people thanking you for a great presentation about lear learning a lot about this. Um, as Michelle said, if you are part of the Manalapin uh, watershed, she would like to have you guys stick around. I'm gonna go ahead and close up the poll but thank you everyone for sticking with us next week. Um, join us again for our, our, our seven out of eight weeks of uh, Earth Day every day, where we'll be having Xenia Morin talking about uh, climate change and food systems. So if you're interested in that, please come back next week and we'll see you then. Um, but thank you all for your, your time tonight. We really appreciate it. And thanks for, for, for sticking with us and filling out the poll. Thanks, Steve. We'll go ahead and stop the recording. <laughs>